I always love hearing this parable because every single time I hear it, it causes a question to come in my heart. What character am I in this parable? Am I the rich man or am I Lazarus? And I just heard this gospel two hours ago almost exactly. And in that time, I've questioned myself in the last two hours, who am I? Because I've been different. Why? To be very blunt with you, the rich man is selfish, and Lazarus, the poor man, is selfless. And in these last two hours, I've been selfish, I'm sure. I know I have. When I had that extra cookie, whatever it may have been. But also, hopefully, to be selfless. And this is why this parable always strikes me, and it's meant to strike you as well. Now, who is Jesus addressing this parable to? To the Pharisees. And who are the Pharisees? These people that thought they were so righteous all the time. But let's dive a little deeper into the parable. And I'll repeat some of it, but that's to help us understand it more deeply, just like when we heard it during the gospel. But I love the image here, right? This rich man who dined sumptuously. And we can hear about this from the first reading to Amos, those who dine on ivory, those who have everything, the finest, whatever. This is this rich man dining sumptuously, fine linens, purple garments, not a worry in his mind, living the good life. And the other person that we have in the story, of course, is Lazarus, this poor man, who was at the door of the rich man. And we can imagine what he looked like, covered with sores. Dogs used to come and lick his sores. He would have gladly have eaten, what, the scrapes off the table of the rich man. But he wasn't even able to do that. They didn't give it to him. But what happened to both of them? They both died. The rich man died. And Lazarus died as well. And this should strike us automatically in our life. That we know that there's going to be an end. Even if Jesus comes down right now, there's still an end. We're not going to be in this world anymore. We're either going to the next world, up above, or that other place. As we continue with the parable, we hear this as well. That when Lazarus died, what happened? He was also, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. How beautiful an image is that in your mind? That when you pass away, you're carried away by angels. That's what we should strive for, right? Yet this rich man also died and was buried. And from the netherworld, where he was in torment... He raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off. We don't want to do that, do we? Of course not. But there he is in the netherworld. And he sees Abraham far off. And he sees Lazarus far off at Abraham's side. And he cries out, Father, Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am suffering torment in these flames. Why didn't he ask Lazarus to do it? Well, I think one of the reasons is he knows Lazarus more than likely would say no. Because he did absolutely nothing for Lazarus in his whole life. Yet he knew Lazarus' name. He knew who that man was. Because he saw him every single day. But he didn't want to ask him because, well, he said, uh, I can't do this. Instead, Father Abraham. Which proves to us that this rich man was who? An Israelite, a Jewish person. And more than likely, so was Lazarus, the poor man. So they both believed in the same God. Yet this rich man went to Abraham. No, send Lazarus to do it. But what does Abraham say? He goes on to say, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime. Well, Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. You notice how he doesn't say Lazarus is living sumptuously, gloriously? None of that. But he's saying now he is living in comfort where now you have torment. But not only that, between you and I, between us, is this great chasm, this great divide, that even if we wanted to go to you, we can't, because we're separated. We cannot come from this world to the netherworld or the other way around in this parable, right? We cannot go from heaven to that other place, that other place to heaven. We are in our place, and all of a sudden we get it. All of a sudden this rich man finally gets it. He understands, I'm here, I'm stuck. And you know in the back of his mind he's going, all right, I messed up. But he doesn't stop there, does he? He says, Father Abraham, once again, not talking to Lazarus, Father Abraham, 
Please, then I beg you, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. So he knows that what his brothers are doing, what he did, was wrong. So why don't you send Lazarus there? And of course, Abraham responds, what? Well, we have sent many, many different messages. It's not like you were unaware of what you were called to do. We had Moses and the prophets. And what does this rich man do? He laughs and responds, oh, no, 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 Father Abraham. If someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. Now, this is an interesting line, the end of the parable, right? So we're going to foreshadow a little bit here. Because what does Abraham say in this parable? If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. Now we know someone rose from the dead. Don't we? To those same exact Pharisees. And when he rose from the dead off that cross, did they repent? Did they change? No. Why? Because they were so concerned about their self. They were so selfish, they didn't want to change because it may cause them a little bit of pain. It may cause them not to be building up worldly allurements. Someone did raise from the dead. It didn't cause them to change. They refused to see it because they were blind by their own selfishness. Where Lazarus in this story has absolutely nothing. So there's nothing to blind him, and this is why he's able to go to God in heaven. Now, we always, always have this question in the back of our mind, right? This huge question I ask married couples all the time, marriage prep at least. I go, and what's the point of marriage and what's the point of life? Well, to help each other get to heaven in marriage, right? What's the point of life? Hopefully, to get to heaven. But even before that, right? To glorify God. But how do we do that? We know that beautiful passage from John 14, right? A lot of funerals have it. It's a beautiful passage. It's a great one. It's an awesome passage. Jesus says what? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. How do we come to the Father? How do we follow in Lazarus' footsteps? By following Jesus and his example. He has shown us the way. We know how to do it. But in order for it to happen, what does it mean? It must mean we have to die to ourselves. And let Christ live in us. Our own wants, our own desires, even sometimes our own needs need to be put to the side so that we may glorify God. I'm going to give you three practical examples of how to do this. Following in Jesus' footsteps. First off, God has given us so many gifts, what are we called to do with them? Unlike this rich man, we're not called to hold on to them to build up worldly possessions. We are called to what? Take the gifts that God has given us Yes, financial gifts, but also this the natural gifts that we have, our own talents, our own whatever it may be, and use them to glorify God. We can see this with Jesus, right? He outreaches those who are in need. We can look at Jesus and the lepers. There are the lepers on the side of the road, ringing the bell, unclean, unclean, stay away from me. But what does Jesus do? He walks right up to them. He touches them. He heals them, and most importantly, he shows them that they, they deserve dignity and respect and love. He's not afraid about getting dirty. He's not afraid about contracting leprosy. Of course, we have the great example of St. Damien of Malachi, that great saint in Hawaii, right, who went and gave of himself because they knew that they too needed Christ. So much to the point that he himself contracted, not contracted, but got the disease of leprosy. But he did it with joy because he was able to bring Christ into God's sons and daughters. So how are we supposed to minister to the lepers today? We more than likely don't have lepers here in Excelsior, but we do have people that we treat like they have leprosy. Those who don't fit the social norm. Those who maybe rub us the wrong way. How do we treat the lepers of Excelsior, Shorewood, Chanhas, and Minnetonka, Greenwood, whatever it may be? How do we outreach to them, those who are longing and are in need? We are called to go and minister to them, just like Jesus did, just like the great saints. What's another way we can follow in Jesus' footsteps? Of course, it's simply by prayer. 
How often did Jesus go to prayer? 40 days and 40 nights in the desert before the transfiguration. How many times was he praying in the boat when storms were going on around him? Praying before he went to the cross. Why? He was going to God and saying, God, give me everything. He is God, by the way. He's saying, Father, what is your will? What do you want me to do? This is what we are called to do in prayer as well, to go to him and say, Father, how do you want me to serve you? How do you want me to be your son and your daughter? And he will answer. In prayer, you might get that feeling, that emotion of, maybe I should call this person. Maybe I should go and visit my mom or my dad. Maybe my next door neighbor just needs a thank you card. Those are very simple things. You know what else he's going to tell you in prayer? Change. Repent. Stop being selfish. He tells me that every single day. And this is what we do in prayer. We say, God, not what can you do for me, but what can I do for you? What do you will of me to do? And he will respond. This rich man never went to prayer in an honest way. He'd probably go there begging his chest and saying, I am a sinner, but not like that person. What we're called to do is simply go in front of God and say, God, what do you will me to do? And of course, the last way and the most important way is that we give ourselves completely over to the service of God. A self-gift. Look at Jesus on the cross, totally giving his life for us. This is what we are called to do as well. To give it freely, over and over and over again. Jesus could have had anything in the world. He could have been exalted the king of the world. Not a problem. They wanted to do it. And what did he always tell them? No, no, no. Why? Because he knew it was not about this kingdom. Rather, it was about the kingdom eternally. The eternal kingdom. And this is where he wanted to lead us. And this is where he does lead us. This is where he shows us to go. We are not called to build up a world, a life for ourselves in this world. But rather, we are called to get ready for the next one. Which means that we give of ourselves completely now. What would have happened if this rich man would have truly helped out Lazarus, would have went to prayer, and would have given of himself? Would he still have died? Yes, of course he would have. But would he have been sent off to a place of torment? No. Would Lazarus have died? Yes. But probably not when he did. Because someone would have been able to help him and give him the food he needs, the love he needs, the respect he needs. But in order for that to happen, for the lepers of our days, for the Lazaruses of our days, in order for that to happen, we ourselves need to be selfless. Who are you? Who am I in this story? It's going to change every single minute sometimes. That's honest. That's true. But who do you desire to be? Do you desire to be the rich man who has everything in this world and nothing in the next? Or desire to be Lazarus, who, yes, sometimes may have sores. Yes, but sometimes may be offended, or people may not love as much as they should, but has God in heaven. Put it much more simply. Do you desire to be selfish, or do you desire to give of yourself? It's up to you. It's up to me. We know what God wants us to do. How are you going to answer 